So it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor David Ruskies from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. Um, he's author of many books, many wonderful books, um, some of which you still could buy yesterday and maybe they are still available here in this moment. He also is a civil editor of the Yiddish Library, New Yiddish Library in New York, and um, he is chair of uh, Yiddish um, studies at the um, seminary, um, the so Evelyn and Saul Hankin um, chair, and he also is a professor of Jewish studies at the same place. So um, uh, before um, I tell about him much more, um, I would very much like to just tell you and urge you to read his work and ask him to come and uh, uh, speak to you uh, this morning. Thank you. Good morning to you all. How many in this room have been to the uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington? Okay. So those of you who have been there, perhaps you were in the room, it's the same room that has the half of, of a boxcar uh, that was brought from Poland. And in that room, in a corner, uh, is a uh, milk canister. Does any of you remember the, the milk canister? That's one of two milk canisters that were dug out uh, in December of 1950 from beneath the, the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto, containing the second half of the Ringelblum Archive, also known as the Oinig Shabbos Archive, the Pleasure of the Sabbath Archive. That is the subject of uh, my uh, class today. Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, if you were at the museum and somehow missed it, uh, and if you haven't been there yet, it is worth the trip to Washington to see the milk canister. Because uh, that archive is the largest and single most important underground archive in all of Nazi-occupied Europe. Jews, non-Jews, it does across the board. That uh, is the single most important archive that has survived. So, how do we know what we know about uh, Jewish life in the Nazi-occupied uh, ghettos, and in particular in the Warsaw Ghetto. So we're going to focus on Warsaw because of the work and the vision of one individual, uh, a professional historian named Emanuel Ringelblum. And Ringelblum, uh, who uh, was born in uh, 1900, so it's easy enough to figure out how old he is as the war progresses. You don't, have to any, you don't need any fancy mathematics. Uh, so at the age of, 19, 30, uh, of 39, he already had a doctorate in uh, Jewish history. He, he got it from Warsaw University. He wrote it about the history of the Jews in Warsaw in the 18th century. Uh, and he intended to continue writing the history of Jews in Warsaw. And now the war broke out. And he saw uh, the war. And even before the, the ghetto was established, the ghetto was uh, hermetically sealed off from the outside world. Uh, only in November of uh, 1940, there was a process of, uh, of a ghettoization that pre preceded it, but the actual ghetto walls were not closed off and sealed until the 15th of November 1940. But already in, in the first uh, weeks of the Nazi occupation of Warsaw, he already saw this as an historic opportunity to study not only Jewish life in uh, extremis, but in particular in that part of the world which was Warsaw. He saw uh, the Nazi ghetto as a kind of urban experiment, as a way of studying a people in miniature, because it became an ingathering of Jews from all, all walks of life, and not only from Warsaw, but from many, many surrounding provinces. So as a professional historian, he saw this as an opportunity to study uh, his own uh, people. And for that purpose, he assembled a band of brothers, a band of comrades, um, 
around this underground archive, they began to meet clandestinely on uh, Saturday afternoons. And that was the genesis of this code name, Oinig Shabbos, Pleasure of the Sabbaths. I don't know whether he or one of his co-workers came up with the name since they had begun to meet on the Sabbath that they would call it by that name and no one would know what uh, their real purpose was. He assembled uh, around himself people whom he could trust. And in those days, trustworthiness was the same as party affiliation. If you belong to the right political party, then you, uh, he knew that they, you could, uh, they could be trusted. He himself was a member of uh, uh, the right uh, Poaletzion, the labor Zionist, or the, no, excuse me, the left labor Zionist, uh, Linke Poaletzion. Um, so labor Zionism, and the labor part and the left labor Zionist, it's, it's all very arcane uh, in, in our own day and age, it meant that they were pro-Soviet as opposed to the right labor Zionists who were anti-Soviet. But of course, uh, the Zionist part of it was extremely important, looking to the settlement of Jews in Palestine as uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, important ultimate solution to the problem of Jews in, in, in the diaspora. This was a movement committed to doing cultural work in the present. Until the day when Jews moved to Palestine, what was needed was cultural activity to create an autonomous Jewish culture, both in Hebrew and particularly in Yiddish. They placed a very, very high emphasis on doing cultural work in Yiddish because that was the language of the Jewish masses. So many of the core members of his group, the ones whom he trusted, uh, were party members from his own party. And since the work was secret, you had to know and trust the pe uh, who your co-workers were. So the co many of the, the inner circle were drawn from one or another part of the spectrum of uh, the Zionist, uh, pre-war Zionist movement in, in Poland. Another important component was where the money came from. Uh, this was uh, a very expensive undertaking to uh, have a staff working and copying materials, and you had to keep them alive uh, under wartime conditions. The money came from the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, thanks to one individual whose name was Yitzhak Gitterman, who had been the head of the JDC in Poland before the war. He had an American passport. He had every opportunity to flee, to go off, to go back to America, uh, and he chose to stay. And he ended up dying in, uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was one of uh, Ringelblum's closest associates, worked with him until the, the very end of his life. And he was the channel for the funding uh, that came uh, from America uh, via the JDC. There were also a number of wealthy patrons who supported the group, who were uh, merchants, members of the merchant class, who, whom uh, Ringelblum had befriended. All of this, by the way, is soon going to be described in meticulous detail in a book that I hope will appear next year. Indiana University Press will publish it uh, by my dear friend and colleague Samuel Casso, K-A-S-S-O-W. And that will be an intellectual biography, both of Emanuel Ringelblum and a group portrait of the Oinik Shabbos. So whatever I'm telling you now is only uh, uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg. And we will soon have a real historical uh, study of this group and, and of this remarkable man. Most important for our purposes, the members of the Oinik Shabbos were internally trilingual. Everyone who worked there knew Yiddish new Hebrew, new Polish. They came prepared with all the linguistic tools that one needed to study uh, Polish Jewry. And each of them also had prior training, either as economists or as historians or as professional journalists or as sociologists. He handpicked the members of his group, knowing that uh, what he wanted to do was to create a group portrait of all aspects of Jewish life. The scope of the work is extraordinary. The scope that they established for themselves, which they more or less were able to accomplish, is truly um, uh, remarkable. Now, 
some of you may know that the origins of Jewish uh, scholarship were in Germany, in a movement, oh, we don't even have a blackboard here, but if uh, next time you invite me to lecture, make sure there's a blackboard in the room, because uh, I was going to write things down. I'd forgotten to mention that. Um, the, the founders of Jewish scholarship were called Wissenschaft des Judentums, the science of Judaism. And this was in Germany at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, Gretz and Steinschneider, um, and really great historians. But uh, Ringelblum came from a different direction, a direction that came into uh, being in Poland between the two world wars. And the center of this scholarship was the YIVO Institute, the Yiddischer Wissenschaftlicher Institut, which was really the exact opposite of Wissenschaft des Judentums. First of all, their concern was not Judaism, but Jews, not Judentums. They were interested in the life of Jews, the social, economic life of living, breathing Jews. Not the history of Jews in times past, but uh, the study of present day uh, Jewry. That had been the focus of the work of the uh, YIVO Institute. And equally important, a scholarship that was to be conducted not in German, so that the world could partake of this and learn about the great accomplishments and achievements of uh, Judaism in the past, but scholarship in Yiddish, because this was self-study for the purpose of building a Jewish polity in Poland or in the diaspora, wherever Jews might be, in their own language. It was to serve their own self-understanding, scholarship as a tool of Jewish self-understanding. And that was Ringelblum's program in the Warsaw Ghetto. It's exactly that uh, vision, to study the life of Jews and the Jewish collective in the present moment. And uh, to do it in the languages that Jews speak in the present moment. So, uh, in, 19, in January of 1942, they had already been collecting a lot of material. At that critical juncture, Ringelblum understood that there was, it was time now to begin to summarize, to organize the material, because they had amassed so much raw data that uh, something had to be done with it. So they came up with an idea, which wasn't original to them. This was one of the uh, techniques that the YIVO had already perfected in Poland between the two world wars, to have an essay contest, to announce a contest in the ghetto, which tells you that not everything they were doing was completely hush-hush, because obviously they had to publicize that uh, among uh, the ghetto population. And just to give you a flavor of the scope of what it was that they were studying. Here uh, are the rules, you don't have this in your handout, rules for a competition of gathering uh, and describing facts and events on selected themes of Jewish life during the war. So the organizing com committee, uh, chaired of course by Ringelblum, met on the 22nd of January 1942, and they announced a ghetto-wide competition on any of the following subjects. And I'm just going to run through it. One, a monograph on Jewish life in a city. That meant a city outside of Warsaw because there were already, by this time, 150,000 refugees from outlying communities. So Ringelblum knew that this was a unique and probably historic opportunity to study not only the life of Jews in Warsaw proper, but to interview people from uh, and to reconstruct the life uh, and also destruction of Jewish communities in all the surrounding provinces, dozens and dozens and dozens of them. So that was one subject. Two, Jewish-Polish relations. And that's number two in importance, and we'll come back to that. Three, converts in the ghetto. Because under the Nuremberg Laws, even if you were converted to Christianity, but going back a generation or two, you were still considered a Jew. And there was a church inside the ghetto, a Catholic church, 
that was attended with great frequency by, by recent converts to Catholicism. Many of the members of the Jewish police were, were, Jewish, were converts from, uh, uh, to Christianity. This was a social phenomenon that also had to be studied. Four, the school system. Five, the situation of the child. Children, we spoke about that yesterday. The fate of orphans, beggars, and soon we'll talk about smugglers who were children. Uh, next, bribery in the ghetto, including the Jewish police. And, and remember that everything that was housed in the Oinik Shabbos was kept strictly confidential. Ringelblum instructed his co-workers to write as if the war were already over, psychologically, to write as if the war were already over so that they wouldn't have to censor themselves. Because by the time the war was over, either the people implicated would be dead or it wouldn't be important anymore. It, it would be an, another political reality and, and all of these things could cut out, come out into the open. Next, smuggling as a separate subject of scholarly inquiry and self-study, and that's going to be the subject of my lecture. Uh, next, a branch of the economy, namely the ghetto economy. Next, the house committees. These were self-governing, uh, this was the core of the grassroots organization in the ghetto. Um, the architecture of urban architecture in Eastern Europe was around uh, courtyards. You'd walk along a very narrow street and uh, with tall buildings with almost no windows looking out onto the street. You wouldn't know where you were. You could think you were in some sort of medieval uh, city. And then you walked into a narrow um, gate uh, through a door and you entered into an, an entirely different world because you entered into a courtyard surrounded on all sides by apartment buildings. And that was the urban organization of many, many cities, particularly uh, Warsaw. Ringelblum understood that this was a way of organizing Jewish life uh, in smaller units, in a Gemeinschaft, instead of a Gesellschaft, to, that each courtyard was a Gemeinschaft, a small uh, nucleus of a community. And he, he, at the very beginning of the war, organized 3,000 such um, house committees to become self-governing boards. And now he wanted to see how they had developed. Entertainment and dissolute behavior in the ghetto. Next subject, the Isle of Tears, which is what they called the refugee points, to study the life of 150,000 refugees. Another subject was September 1939, to try to recollect what the outbreak of the war was like. He, he knew that so much had already transpired. No one would even remember what the first weeks and months of the war had been. So this would be a chance to recapitulate. The police, another subject, moments of solemnity and elevation. The next is social activities and leaders in the ghetto, that is to say the cultural figures, and, and, and then incidental themes. So the scope of self-study was, uh, was extraordinary. It was really vast. And that is why what was finally preserved and unearthed in the 10 um, cans, uh, metal tins, and two milk canisters is truly encyclopedic. There is no accident here. This was part of a determined and organized effort of self-study. So what we have today in the uh, Oinik Shabbos archive are monographs and chronicles and diaries and letters and eyewitness accounts and uh, wills and testimonies and reportage and short stories and novels and plays um, and class compositions. Since they were studying schools, they also collected class compositions of children. We have poems, we have songs, sermons, folklore collections full of jokes and sayings. Um, we have maps, we have graphics, we have photos, we have statistics, we have artworks, we have a complete set of the underground press, uh, broadsides, you name it, just about everything that, re uh, that was produced in the ghetto. Not everything, but just about everything. And all of that was collected as part of an organized effort at self-study. 
What we don't have, and Ringelblum regretted this at the very end, uh, are a complete set of records of the Judenrat. There was a very deep animosity between Ringelblum's group, uh, Lucy Davidovich calls them the alternative community, um, and the official community, which was the Judenrat. Uh, the Judenrat worked hand in glove with the Gestapo and followed the Gestapo's orders in, in all things. Uh, the Jewish mail delivery was run through the Judenrat. Uh, the police was run through the Judenrat. Uh, hygiene and all, all, all official life in the ghetto was run through the Judenrat. And at the very end, uh, he, uh, Ringelblum understood that he had made a terrible mistake, that he should have had someone there feeding him this material, that, that much of it would be lost, and indeed it was. So the fact that we have today the diary of Adam Cherniakov, who was the first head of the uh, Warsaw Judenrat, is not thanks to Ringelblum. It survived miraculously through other channels. And Ringelblum mentions that diary and regrets the fact that it's not part of his archive. He obviously had no way of knowing that it would, have, that it would survive on its own. But other than that, that's the great lacuna, the blind spot. Other than that, all other aspects of Jewish life in the ghetto are... Um, reflected. But more than that, Ringelblum was committed to re uh, a multiplicity of perspectives. He knew, as a professional historian, that uh, you didn't want to write history from the top down. You needed to reflect all segments of society, young and old and secular and religious, um, and the second competition that they had was specifically geared to adolescents in the ghetto and inviting them to submit their diaries or autobiographies. And this was also part of the YIVO's agenda between the two world wars, to study adolescents as a separate critical group, which was a sea change in the understanding of Jewish culture. Jewish culture has always been seen as elitist, and intellectual, and the only people you're interested in are the rabbis, and uh, and the male, the rich, and the and the learned. And suddenly, you, uh, the Evo said, "No. What's really interesting is young people entering into their lives. What is the crisis of identity that they are undergoing?" They had to make up a word for adolescence, because the word did not exist in Yiddish. There was no such word. The term itself did not exist. It wasn't on their map, in their conceptual map. So Max Weinreich created a word. Uh, adolescence, it's not a widely known term, but der Wachsling is an adolescent, and adolescence is der Wachslingschaft. He had to make the word up, because it just did not exist. So, uh, in their youth competition, it says here, the competition embraces youth from all circles of Jewish society, working class, middle class, youth belonging to the Jewish intelligentsia, students, and youth from the provinces. That means not just native to Warsaw, but from all the outlying provinces. Thanks to the encyclopedic scope of Oynek Shabbos, and thanks to its commitment to reflect all points of view, we can reconstruct the debates that raged within the ghetto. And we get a very dynamic portrait. And that is what we're going to be looking at today, unpacking, uh, thanks to Ringelblum, one of the key debates that occurred in the ghetto over the issue of smuggling. OK, so let me just briefly uh, I can't move from here now because of the camera, but uh, uh, what I have here are two maps of uh, the Warsaw Ghetto. So this map comes from uh, a, a magazine, a Polish magazine that came out last uh, year, and uh, this is kind of the Polish version of the New York Times. So if you can imagine the New York Times magazine section running a special insert on, on a ghetto, well, this is, this is what... And, this, and it's called uh, The City That No Longer Exists. And it's an extraordinary, the first really uh, academically accurate map was published in a magazine of the Warsaw Ghetto. 
what's most important for you to see is that it's smack in the middle of Warsaw. It's not in some outlying suburb, but if you can imagine New York City, if there was a ghetto where Central Park uh, is uh, it's the very middle of the city, there is no way you can cross from one part of Warsaw to the other without bumping into the ghetto walls, because this was the historic uh, Jewish quarter. So this is a color-coded map. It shows you where the ghetto was originally and how it shrunk and it broke down into smaller and smaller uh, uh, segments. But there's another map of the ghetto, um, which is an internal map. And you can't, I'll pass this around. The other one I don't think I, I will, but this one I will definitely pass around. It's a map of the ghetto divided up into um, rabbinic jurisdictions, if you can believe that. The ghetto divided up into 28 rabbinic jurisdictions. What is a rabbinic jurisdiction? It means that in each of these units, there is one rabbi who is authorized to answer religious questions. And so it's, it's, it's a kind of districting, districting, but for religious purposes alone. So this is a Jewish map of the ghetto. And in there, uh, there are certain key places that are mentioned. The uh, Oinik Shabbos uh, met somewhere over here. Um, the Judenrat met in another part of the ghetto. But the most important piece of it, for our purposes, uh, uh, Mr. Cameraman, are you, are you with me? Uh, tell me if you're losing me or not. Um, our story will take place right over here. If we're talking about smuggling, where does smuggling happen in any society? On the border, obviously. You have to be on the border between in and out. So here we are at the very outer reaches of the, the uh, ghetto on a little tiny street, which is Koja Alley, looking out over actually a, a rather fancy part of, of Warsaw on the other side of the ghetto walls. And this is where the story is going to take place, right up here. Oh, actually, why not? You can see the other one, too. What did I bring it for, if not to show it to you? This is the other map. So, again, it's a map of, and, and it's very peculiar because it looking at a Hebrew rabbinic map of the Warsaw Ghetto projects a completely different perception of what that piece of urban real estate was about. We look at this and we think to ourselves, what was this, a state within the state? Is this some sort of you know, Jewish state that is self-governing? But it couldn't possibly be that because it's a Nazi-occupied ghetto. They are not in control of anything and yet they were able to take that space that was allotted to them and reorganize it for their own purposes. And uh, to try to make sense of it, to uh, an overlay of a Jewish grid onto that uh, space of urban uh, squalor and suffering. So, they studied, among other subjects, smuggling. And there were two completely divergent schools of thought. If any of you has ever studied rabbinic literature, you know that uh, in the Talmud, whenever there's a debate, there, there are two sides. There is Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel. We know today that many uh, positions are ascribed to them. Uh, not, but it's, it's a mnemonic device. There really was a Shammai and there really was a Hillel. They did exist. But two-thirds of the positions that are ascribed to them are, are, are basically uh, pedagogical. They're didactic ways in which the rabbis try to remember uh, for future reference that there are two points of view. The strict letter of the law was always the position taken by the house of Shammai. And the more... I don't know, liberal, uh, inclusive, was the house of Hillel. Well, this is what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto. There were two schools of thought on the subject of 
um, smuggling. Beit Shammai. And here is our first uh, text that you have in your handout. This is the diary, the ghetto diary of Chaim Kaplan. Uh, a very important diary. Uh, it's been translated into English uh, from the Hebrew. He himself was a, an instructor of Hebrew in a Hebrew high school. He knew the Bible by heart, and it is no surprise, therefore, that he kept his diary in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, but full of uh, biblical quotations. Now, what does he have to say about smuggling in the ghetto? So this is uh, from this paragraph, the, his entry for the 7th of January, 1942. I'm reading from the very middle of the English. He says, two leeches suck our marrow. Can you see where I'm reading? Okay. It's the middle of the... The begin top of the page says Chaim A. Kaplan. See, those of you who have been out of school too long, you're, you're out of practice, guys. You've got to be much quicker. Okay. So, in the middle of that paragraph, it, there's nothing... I don't want to count the number of lines. It'll take too long. Uh, you'll read a sentence. It's, start, it's, it's not the beginning of a line. It's the middle of a line. Two leeches suck our marrow. The Nazi leech... The elite of the elites and the primum mobile, the first father in setting up the machinery to make us perish and suck our blood, and its spawn, the Jewish leech born of contraband and price gouging. Despite draconian measures, smuggling does not cease. Even the danger of death does not restrain it. Rather, as those means become more severe and harsh, they drive up prices. Every price rise increases the extent of the profits. That is in reference to the large-scale smugglers who are in cahoots with the Nazis and share their spoils with them. No eye oversees their misdeeds, and they have permission to set prices as they see fit. Everything depends on their hard hearts and avid greed for wealth. That, and now this is very interesting, that he ends this entry with a biblical quotation. That is human nature. In a crisis, the urge grows stronger. Eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And in the Hebrew, it's very powerful. He says, alukot <laughs> This is a modern uh, Hebrew, almost uh, contemporary Hebrew. This is... Uh, not biblical. This is a modern uh, addiction. And very, very um, tough, very tough prose, very exact, um, as befits an intellectual of his stature. That was not his position alone, that the smugglers were the scum of the earth, that they were essentially no different from organized crime, was a position that was held by, among others, the Jewish Socialist Bund. So we know we have the underground press from the Warsaw Ghetto, and the Bund uh, produced more underground. There, were, there was kind of neck-and-neck -neck competition between the Bundists and the Zionists of various stripes. All the youth movements had an underground uh, publication. In the Bundist underground press, they, they strike out against the smugglers. Why? Because they undermine the solidarity of the working class. They're, it, it's an, they're exploiting. It's, they're exploiting the poor. And anyone who exploits the poor is, by definition, uh, according to Marx's doctrine, uh, evil to the very core. Some of you may have seen the movie The Pianist. Yes? Uh, which is based on the uh, memoirs and diary of Władysław Spielmann, S-Z-P-I-L-M-A-N, the pianist. It's been published now. Read what he has to say about the smugglers in the ghetto, the same extraordinarily negative point of view. So there's no question that many people, 
maybe even the majority of people in the ghetto, saw the smugglers as the... There are two leeches, the Nazi leech on the outside and the Jewish leech sucking the marrow of our bones. And I think that's a defensible position because the only source of food, the ghetto was established in order to starve the Jews into submission. The, the Germans thought that the solution to the Jewish problem would be ghettoization. You close them up into small, you take the worst real estate, the poorest neighborhoods, you, you crowd in as many people as cannot fit into that space, and they will die. They will simply die of starvation and of disease. That was the calculation. So smuggling is the main source of, of, of bringing food in from the outside. But there is a Beit Hillel. There is an opposing point of view that sees smuggling as something positive. And the main spokesman for that point of view was Ringelblum himself. And so, in Ringelblum's own words, and I'm quoting here from uh, Ringelblum's retrospective essay, uh, which I have in my Literature of Destruction. There's a long essay called Oinik Shabbos, written by Ringelblum in January of 1943. And I'm just going to read one passage on the subject of smuggling. It's on, no, it's not in your handout. So you just have to listen. He says, There is no important phenomenon of Jewish life in wartime that was not mirrored in the materials of Oinik Shabbos. And that is no empty claim. A subject such as smuggling which is always extremely important in wartime, is represented in Oinik Shabbos by the works of Comrade Tittelman, and they called each other comrades, Chaver. They used the terminology of the political parties, not Mr., because that's very bourgeois, and not doctor or anything like that. Everyone was, was a comrade. They were a band of comrades. Um, comrade Tittelman. In his work, we see the tremendous scope of smuggling in Warsaw. During the whole period of the ghetto's existence, it saved the 400,000 members of the Jewish community from dying of starvation. If the Jews of Warsaw had had to live on the official ration of 18 deca of bread a day, all traces of Jewish Warsaw would long since have vanished. Smuggling caused the loss of several Jewish lives every day, and on the eve of the deportation, which I spoke about yesterday, a dozen or dozens of lives a day. Now, this is how he concludes. In the liberated Poland of the future, a monument should be set up to smuggling, which, by the way, also saved the Polish population of the city from dying of hunger. So this, if this was Ringelblum's position, you can imagine that this will be represented, well represented, in the materials that were preserved. And indeed, uh, we have this poem uh, that was enormously popular in the ghetto. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the music for it, but I know that it was set to music. And I have it here for you in three different languages. Uh, at the very bottom is the Polish original. It was written by Henrika Lazowert. And the little blurb tells you that she was a member of the Jewish Self-Help Society. That and the head of the Jewish Self-Help Society in the Warsaw Ghetto was none other than, can you guess, Emanuel Ringelblum. Wherever you look, Emanuel Ringelblum. He was really an organizational genius. And uh, she was one of the key members of the Oinik Shabbos, a Polish-language Jewish poet and a member of the Polish Writers' Association who died in Treblinka. So she wrote this poem, and it is a poem about the little smuggler. And I will just read a few stanzas. Over the wall, through holes and past the guard, through the wires, ruins and fences, plucky, hungry and determined, I sneak through, dart like a cat. So what you have to imagine is this song performed in a Polish cabaret in the ghetto, because this is cabaret, it's a cabaret kind of song with the same rhyme scheme, and somebody dressed up as a child uh, singing this song in Polish and impersonating something from the reality that everybody knew, namely children who were smugglers. At noon, at night, at dawn, in snowstorm, cold or heat, a hundred times I risked my life and put my head on the line. Under my arm, a gunny sack, tatters on my back, on nimble young feet with endless fear in my heart. But 
one must endure it all, one must bear it all, so that tomorrow morning the fine folks can eat their fill. So here is a note of social criticism. Who am I feeding? The fat cats of the ghetto. I'm not doing it for my own sake, but I'm going to sell it to the highest bidder, to those people who are rich enough to be able to buy my smuggled goods. But the last part, the second, the second half of the poem, tells you that there is another concern that the little smuggler has, and that is feeding her own mother. Because in the ghetto reality, everything is topsy-turvy. It's not parents taking care of their children, but children looking out for their parents. So, the last stanza is, I will return, and if the hand of destiny should seize me in the game, that's a common trick of life. You, mother, do not wait up for me. I will return no more to you. My voice will not be heard from afar. The dust of the street will bury the lost fate of a child. And only one request will stiffen on my lips. Who, mother mine? Who will bring your bread tomorrow? So, this is what Ringelblum means, that in the Poland of tomorrow, there has to be a monument to the Jewish smuggler, both the, the, the adult smuggler and particularly the self-sacrifice of the children who were uh, obviously small enough so that they could crawl under the wall or through holes in the wall, and uh, they were nimble on their feet. And uh, we, there is even a book about uh, a group of uh, Jewish smugglers who survived the war together on the Aryan side. It's called the, uh, the Place of the Three Crosses, and it's been translated by one of their number. No. The Swiss, the cigarette, sellers. cigarette sellers of the place. Of, thank you. The Cigarette Sellers by Yosef Zemian, Z-E-M-I-A-N. That's right. Uh, so we have quite a bit of documentation. But all of this is just a warm-up for the real uh, masterpiece on this subject. And you have the full text in, uh, in both languages. And that is uh, Peretz Opochinsky's Chronicle, his reportage. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to read it with you, but I'm, I will set it up for you so that you can take it home and read it at your leisure and, and appreciate it uh, at when you can. Peretz Opochinsky was a lifelong labor Zionist, right? So the same political party that uh, Ringelblum belonged to was also his party. Uh, he had already fought in the First World War. He had been a prisoner of war uh, during the First World War, and had uh, so he had a historical memory going back to the to war before that. He had been a very accomplished journalist in the Yiddish press in Poland, and his specialty, mark this, was Polish Jewish poverty and the spiritual decline of Polish Jewry. He would publish vignettes, very bittersweet, uh, slices of uh, Warsaw life in, in the press. So he was obviously uh, a, a perfect choice to work together with uh, Ringelblum. And indeed, he was part of Ringelblum's inner circle. During the day, he worked as a letter carrier, which was a back-breaking, debilitating job. And he has a reportage called The Jewish Letter Carrier. And you can read that, too, in uh, uh, Gladstein's Anthology of Holocaust Literature that Jewish Publication Society put out in the 1960s, you will find a reportage called The Jewish Letter Carrier by Peretz Opochinsky. It's not a first-person chronicle, but it's about his own uh, work as a letter carrier. Yesterday in my lecture, I mentioned cryptic, uh, the cryptic arts that in postcards that were received in the ghetto and in letters that were received in the ghetto, everything was written in code. How do we have these letters? We have these letters because they were the undeliverable mail that Peretz Opochinsky brought to the archive at the end of the day, either because the recipients were dead, had been deported, or for whatever reason, the mail, that piece of the mail that didn't get through, instead of throwing it out, instead of bringing it back to the, post, to the Jewish post office, he brought it to Ringelblum, knowing that this would be some day of, of historic importance, which indeed it is. So the only mail that we still have is the undeliverable mail 
from the Warsaw Ghetto that Opochinsky brought to, to Ringel Bloom, and they buried together with the other, other things. So we know from other eyewitnesses, we know it from uh, Rochel Orbach, only two members of the Onik Shabbos staff, only two of them survived. One of them was Hirsch Wasser, who was the secretary, and the other was Rochel Orbach, a writer in her own right, very important writer. And it was she who single-mindedly said, we have to find this archive, we have to dig it up, we have to dig it up. And they said to her, but there's nothing left of Warsaw. If anyone's seen pictures of Warsaw at the end of 1945, it looks like Hiroshima. I mean, there are only a few buildings standing. 98% of the city was razed to the ground. But the difference between Hiroshima and Warsaw is this. Hiroshima was destroyed in three minutes. Warsaw was destroyed house by house, brick by brick, by orders of Hitler. Hitler's uh, uh, instructions were that no single stone should be left standing in Warsaw, and that's what happened. So after the war, there were no streets left, even if they had the address. They knew where it had been buried, but they couldn't find it. And it was Rochel Auerbach who said, we have to look for it until we find it. It took them a year and a half to find the first part uh, in 1946. And the second part was discovered completely by accident. They were uh, preparing the groundwork uh, for urban renewal. And that's when they found it in, in December 1950. And the third part of the archive, which was buried during the uprising, it was never found. They think it's uh, lying underneath the uh, Chinese embassy of today. So there's very little chance that they're going to blow up the Chinese embassy to find the third part of the Ringelblum archive. Uh, and even if they did, I don't think after 60 years there'd be anything left of it. So this is um, one of many, many, many such works that uh, Opochinsky uh, wrote. And it's also, uh, I, I have to back up another uh, a little bit to explain uh, the particular angle uh, that uh, he uh, uses here. It's a very upbeat description of these smugglers, and they're described with their, uh, their underworld argo, their secret language, and their different types. Uh, and it's extremely colorful. And this is also part of pre-war Jewish culture. There was a cult of the Jewish underworld in Poland, going back to Sholem Ash, going back even, let's say, to the stories of Benya Creek, of Isaac Babel. It wasn't just in Yiddish literature, but in, in Russian Jewish li literature, you can also find the romance of the Jewish gangster. And in America, the, the Amer we know a lot about Jewish gangsters and, and Lansky and, and company. So this was true in Poland as well. Uh, there was a cult of the underworld, and this is a kind of spin-off of that as well. All right, so the reason this is a perfect subject for uh, Opoczynski is this. Opoczynski was always on the lookout for what I called yesterday metonymies. What is the piece that stands for the whole? Because Everything is changing. Everything is in flux. There are close to 400,000 people living in, the, in this small piece of, of uh, urban real estate. How do we capture their life? And so what you have here is a microscopic view of a, the ghetto's social organism. And that's what he specialized in, studying one courtyard, one profession mail delivery, one gang of smugglers. So you take one cross-section, one small group, and through that you try to illuminate a much more complicated uh, social environment. And uh, what's more, if you're really good at what you're doing, you can trace its development through time. And that's what he does here. He gives us a chronological overview of the life of the smugglers, but one in one single 24-hour cycle. He has other uh, reportages that take you through a year, two years of, uh, of the life of a courtyard. Here, it's extremely telescoped. Now, you have to imagine, in fact, it's very hard to 
piece it all together. How did he get this information? He must have hung around this place in between mail deliveries. And somehow or other, he made himself scarce. He was the fly on the wall. Uh, because all of this was I illegal uh, activity, and he took careful notes so that he could put together a composite portrait of 24 hours in the life of smugglers in the Warsaw Ghetto. And in that 24-hour segment, we see it goes, it starts by day, and there's the rise and the fall, like the stock exchange, what happened, the price, how the prices fluctuate, and why the prices will fluctuate. Um, and what are the external factors that will determine price fluctuation? It's extremely detailed. I mean, he took his, the mandate of Ringelblum very, very seriously so that he's reconstructing everything in, in, uh, in great detail. The second thing to keep in mind is that this is a particular literary genre. I mentioned this yesterday. This is called reportage. Uh, reportage is engagé journalism. Engagé, politically engaged journalism. What that means is that we're reading two works for the price of one. Very, very detailed eyewitness, block by block, person by person description. But every now and then, the author injects his own point of view. So let me give you an example of uh, Opochinsky's point of view. This is the bottom of the second page. Do we know where we are? Uh, I think well, we're going to want to leave some time for questions as well, yes? So uh, I'm just going to go through this very, I'm just going to read a passage or two. So at the bottom of the second page, he says as follows. Smuggling, to be sure, is basically a dirty business, a noose on the neck of the hunger-swollen consumer. But nevertheless, under the terrible conditions of the great prison into which Warsaw Jews have been corralled, the ghetto walls, it is the only salvation for the surviving remnants. Who knows? And this echoes exactly what Ringelblum said. In fact, it's the other way around. I think Ringelblum is echoing what he read in this, because this is written before uh, Ringelblum's words that I read to you before. Who knows? Someday, perhaps, we ought to erect a monument to the smuggler for his risks because consequently he thereby saved a good part of Jewish Warsaw from starving to death. The reasons why this is so fascinating to uh, Opochinsky and therefore to the Ornik Shabbos is because they believed in the staying power, the ingenuity, the vitality, the, uh, uh, the, the, the survivability of the Jewish masses. This was written and could only have been written before the great deportation. And so what he chronicles here is the, how smart these people are, how cleverly they devise rickshaws. He says, yeah, yeah, in China there are rickshaws, but until you've seen a rickshaw in the Warsaw Ghetto, you don't really know what a rickshaw is. It's not just a means of conveyance. It's the best way to smuggle goods underneath your seat. There were no horses, there were no tramways, there were no cars in the ghetto. So um, all the, the main f way that you, uh, if you could afford uh, to travel from one place to the other, you hired a rickshaw driver who schlepped you from place to place. So the smugglers capitalized on that and used that as a means of, of smuggling. So this is proof positive of the Jewish survivability, the power of the collective to rise to any occasion. That's point number one. Point number two, we see a culture with its own language. These are Jewish underworld figures that have their own code, their own secret codes, and, uh, and it's extremely colorful. This translation is good, but it's not done by a professional writer. It was done by Lucy Davidovich the historian, and it, it's from her Holocaust reader. Now yesterday I mentioned how devilishly difficult it is to decipher these reportages. She had an inside uh, informant in her husband. Her husband was a survivor of Warsaw. He was a native to Warsaw. So whenever she ran into a word that she couldn't understand, and it's full of words like that, she asked her husband what it meant. 
And uh, so basically they collaborated on it. She, knows, she knew Yiddish very well, but she, there was no way she could have done this on her own. Take it from me. Um, so a lot of the slang and underworld uh, argo uh, she has thanks to him. But the most important element of this story, which for us will seem totally unbelievable, is that the only way smuggling could, survive, could exist was through the very close interaction of Jews and Poles. And this was one of the most important elements uh, for Ringelblum, not only uh, for the present, but he was thinking about the post-war future. And he knew that people would say that the, the Poles were all anti-Semites and they were all out to kill the Jews and there is no hope for, the war proves that there is no hope for Jews in Poland. Well, these documents will prove that even in the worst situations, if you know where to look and how to study these phenomena, you will see that Jews and, and Christian Poles worked hand in glove. And there are very detailed descriptions of how that worked. And the Polish uh, smugglers had to learn a little bit of Yiddish in order to work closely. Because when the Gestapo came, the code word was Pesach. Pesach means destroy the evidence, burn the contraband. Why Pesach? Because what do you do before you prepare for the Seder? You destroy all the leavened goods. You, you, you burn all the, the chametz in your home. So that, that, they didn't make up this word. This is an, an old underground, uh, underworld uh, word. And they're, all the underworld codes are, are basically in Hebrew and Aramaic. So the Polish smugglers know that Pesach means somebody's coming, hide, uh, hide the goods. So there's this comical uh, dialogue between the Jewish smugglers and the Polish smugglers. All of this and much more, uh, a description of street life in the ghetto. And finally, I suppose the, the most uh, important is he is not blind to the terrible social inequality. He knows that these people are living off the sweat uh, uh, of the poor and, and, and the deprived. And he admits as much. The uh, reportage ends on a note of moral condemnation. On a note of moral condemnation. Uh, but uh, so it's morally extraordinarily ambiguous. Uh, here we are on page six. This is the last passage that I will read to you. Uh, on the top of page six, uh, two paragraphs, where he, he focuses on the, the terrible moral, uh, social, and economic disparity. Who cares? The second paragraph on page six. Who cares about the corpse, or rather the dying man who has chosen to lie down in front of Sally's place and plans to die right under the smuggler's feet? On Ostrovska, Volinska, even on Franciszkanska, and the Nalovki, that's all the Jewish streets in the ghetto, the dead lie in the streets as though they were at home. Jews arise in the morning, go out and know they will find dead bodies there. One, two, five, ten, corpses of famine, the bloated dead who hungered through the war and hungering attained death, desired yet hated. But here, in Koja Alley, a squashed fly or a louse, who pays it heed? The smugglers are in shiny boots and fine jackets. The cool September sun gilds their pampered faces. They nibble on the caramels and pastries which the sweet peddlers bring them. And they never even hear the whir of the death bullet as it whizzes by. So it ends on a very strong note of moral condemnation. But that is what it means to live in wartime. It is the light and the darkness. There is, there is uh, corruption, moral depravity. But so long as there are smugglers looking out for you, and there is, that is signal, proof positive, that this collective still has a will and a way to survive. And that's what this is uh, supposed to prove. Yes? Yeah. Um, just, I think, just For those of you who have another class, you may have to. Yes. Most people have to leave, so maybe, maybe just two or three minutes, okay? Well, the one question, I had two questions. One question is, you showed us a place on the map that said this is where the smugglers were. But were they able to smuggle from other parts of the perimeter? It's possible. But for whatever reason, that's the only documented place that we have. This was the central market. 
uh, the central venue. I, I, my guess is that it was centralized around this spot because, look, the whole perimeter of, uh, was guarded. And if you read the uh, description, especially the first paragraphs, you will see why they chose this street. Because part of it, uh, the even numbers look out to the Aryan side and the odd numbers look in the inside. And this building was inhabited both by Christians on one side and Jews on the other. So it, it was this permeable, or what we call a liminal space, betwixt and between. It was perfect for smuggling. And my guess is this was the, the chosen spot. And the other question? More with that, liter more of a literary style, because again, I mean, they're all smugglers were not wearing shiny boots and fine jackets. No. I'm sure a lot of them were really That's true. like like ragamuffin children. That's right. So, well, you'll, if, when you have the chance, you'll read the descriptions, and they're very detailed. And he tells you what uh, he's dealing with the high class smugglers, and there's a hierarchy from the ones, the big shots, who don't get their hands dirty, and the ones he calls the strollers who actually have to physically schlep the stuff from one place to another. And there's a very strict hierarchy of who gets paid hush money and who doesn't get paid hush money. So he's very careful to distinguish between the high class, the middle class, and the real uh, foot soldiers of the smugglers. And those who are on the bottom are on the bottom. There's no question about it. That's one more question, yes? Yes. yes. Uh, with 400,000 people in the, in the ghetto, and um, obviously the, sm the smuggling operation had to be in, of an immense size yes. to, to, to get these people. And with such an immense size and such, such an operation, it had to be going on, what, virtually 24 hours a day? That's right, exactly. And, okay, so my question is, were the guards just that stupid that they couldn't see all no, of this going they were, on? No, everybody was, was, uh, had a part, you know, they were all on the take. Very, very cleverly organized, and it's, it's a testament to their powers of organization that they were able to coordinate what went on inside with what went on outside. Who were the guards who could be corrupted and who couldn't be? Uh, in here you'll find that suddenly the day before yesterday, some, some Gestapo officer came in and the Germans confiscated hundreds of thousands of marks worth of, of merchandise. Okay, so you cut your losses and you keep going. But you're right, it must have been an, and this is only one aspect. I mean, there were, there were different periods in the ghetto, and, uh, and Polish, he has a reportage uh, of Poczynski called Goyim in Ghetto. Uh, you'll forgive me, that's what it's called. That means Gentiles in the ghetto, and it's about the trade in prayer shawls and phylacteries, because the Poles would come to buy up prayer shawls that were made out of wool or silk, and they used it and, and, and leather phylacteries. The leather, there was a shortage of leather. So people, that meant that Jews were selling their prayer shawls and phylacteries, uh, number one, because you would sell whatever you had. You weren't producing anything, so you had to sell whatever possessions. And on the other hand, there were Poles who basically risked their lives to come to the ghetto and buy up this material. Uh, so it was, you know, a give and take. And, uh, and it must have been on a vast scale. And you're, you're right, it doesn't, it's not logical that this one spot in the ghetto could have fed 400,000 people. There must have been other venues as well. I think that we have to finish, unfortunately. But perhaps if you have one or two questions after, the, after we are ready here, perhaps uh, Dr. Vasquez would answer. But I really think almost that we need to leave. <laughs> Thank you. Please return the maps.